Chapter thirty of El Dorado by Baroness Orzy, read for LibriVox.org by Karen Savage in September two thousand and seven. Chapter thirty afterwards. I am sorry, Lady Blakeney, said a harsh, dry voice close to her. The incident at the end of your visit was none of our making, remember. She turned away, sickened with horror at thought of contact with this wretch. She had heard the heavy oaken door swing to behind her on its ponderous hinges and the key once again turn in the lock. She felt as if she had suddenly been thrust into a coffin, and that clods of earth were being thrown upon her breast, oppressing her heart so that she could not breathe. Had she looked for the last time on the man whom she loved beyond everything else on earth, whom she worshipped more ardently day by day? Was she even now carrying within the folds of her kerchief a message from a dying man to his comrades? Mechanically, she followed Chauvelin down the corridor, and along the passages which she had traversed a brief half-hour ago. From some distant church tower a clock told the hour of ten. It had then really only been little more than thirty brief minutes since she first had entered this grim building, which seemed less stony than the monsters who held authority within it. To her it seemed that sentries had gone over her head during that time. She felt like an old woman, unable to straighten her back or to steady her limbs. She could only dimly see some few paces ahead the trim figure of Chauvelin walking with measured steps, his hands held behind his back, his head thrown up with what looked like triumphant defiance. At the door of the cubicle where she had been forced to submit to the indignity of being searched by a wardress, the latter was now standing, waiting with characteristic stolidity. In her hand she held the steel files, the dagger, and the purse which, as Marguerite passed, she held out to her. "'Your property, citizeness,' she said placidly. She emptied the purse into her own hand, and solemnly counted out the twenty pieces of gold. She was about to replace them all into the purse, when Marguerite pressed one of them back into her wrinkled hand. Nineteen will be enough, citizeness,' she said. "'Keep one for yourself, not only for me, but for all the poor women who come here with their heart full of hope, and go hence with it full of despair.' The woman turned calm, lacklustre eyes on her, and silently pocketed the gold piece with a grudgingly muttered word of thanks. Chauvelin, during this brief interlude, had walked thoughtlessly on ahead. Marguerite, peering down the length of the narrow corridor, spied his sable-clad figure some hundred metres further on, as it crossed the dim circle of light thrown by one of the lamps. She was about to follow, when it seemed to her as if someone was moving in the darkness close beside her. The wardress was even now in the act of closing the door of her cubicle, and there were a couple of soldiers who were disappearing from view round one end of the passage, whilst Chauvelin's retreating form was lost in the gloom at the other. There was no light close to where she herself was standing, and the blackness around her was as impenetrable as a veil. The sound of a human creature moving and breathing close to her in this intense darkness acted weirdly on her overwrought nerves. "'Qui va là?' she called. There was a more distinct movement among the shadows this time, as of a swift tread on the flagstones of the corridor. All else was silent round, and now she could plainly hear those footsteps running rapidly down the passage away from her. She strained her eyes to see more clearly, and anon, in one of the dim circles of light on ahead, she spied a man's figure, slender and darkly clad, walking quickly yet furtively like one pursued. As he crossed the light the man turned to look back. It was her brother Armand. Her first instinct was to call to him. The second checked that call upon her lips. Percy had said that Armand was in no danger. Then why should he be sneaking along the dark corridors of this awful house of justice if he was free and safe? Certainly, even at a distance, her brother's movement suggested to Marguerite that he was in danger of being seen. He cowered in the darkness, tried to avoid the circles of light thrown by the lamps in the passage. At all costs Marguerite felt that she must warn him that the way he was going now would lead him straight into Chauvelin's arms, and she longed to let him know that she was close by. Feeling sure that he would recognize her voice, she made pretense to turn back to the cubicle, through the door of which the wardress had already disappeared, and called out as loudly as she dared, "'Good night, citizeness!' But Armand, who surely must have heard, did not pause at the sound. Rather was he walking on more rapidly than before. In less than a minute he would be reaching the spot where Chauvelin stood waiting for Marguerite. That end of the corridor, however, received no light from any of the lamps. Strive how she might, Marguerite could see nothing now either of Chauvelin or of Armand. Blindly, instinctively, she ran forward, thinking only to reach Armand, and to warn him to turn back before it was too late, before he found himself face to face with the most bitter enemy he and his nearest and dearest had ever had. 
but as she at last came to a halt at the end of the corridor, panting with the exertion of running and the fear for Armand, she almost fell up against Chauvelin, who was standing there alone and imperturbable, seemingly having waited patiently for her. She could only dimly distinguish his face, the sharp features and thin, cruel mouth, but she felt, more than she actually saw, his cold, steely eyes fixed with a strange expression of mockery upon her. But of Armand there was no sign, and she, poor soul, had difficulty in not betraying the anxiety which she felt for her brother. Had the flagstone swallowed him up? A door on the right was the only one that gave on the corridor at this point. It led to the concierge's lodge, and thence out into the courtyard. Had Chauvelin been dreaming, sleeping with his eyes open, whilst he stood waiting for her? And had Armand succeeded in slipping past him under cover of darkness, and through that door to safety that lay beyond these prison walls? Marguerite, miserably agitated, not knowing what to think, looked somewhat wild-eyed on Chauvelin. He smiled, that inscrutable, mirthless smile of his, and said blandly, "'Is there aught else I can do for you, citizeness? This is your nearest way out. No doubt Sir Andrew will be waiting to escort you home.' Then, as she, not daring either to reply or to question, walked straight up to the door, he hurried forward, prepared to open it for her. But before he did so, he turned to her once again. "'I trust that your visit has pleased you, Lady Blakeney,' he said suavely. "'At what hour do you desire to repeat it to-morrow?' "'To-morrow?' she reiterated, in a vague, absent manner, for she was still dazed with the strange incident of Armand's appearance and his flight. "'Yes. You would like to see Sir Percy again to-morrow, would you not?' I myself would gladly pay him a visit from time to time, but he does not care for my company. My colleague, Citizen Heron, on the other hand, calls on him four times in every twenty-four hours. He does so a few moments before the changing of the guard, and stays chatting with Sir Percy until after the guard is changed, when he inspects the men and satisfies himself that no traitor has crept in among them. All the men are personally known to him, you see. These hours are at five in the morning, and again at eleven, and then again at five, and eleven in the evening. My friend Heron, as you see, is zealous and assiduous, and, strangely enough, Sir Percy does not seem to view his visit with any displeasure. Now at any other hour of the day, Lady Blakeney, I pray you command me, and I will arrange that Citizen Heron grant you a second interview with the prisoner." Marguerite had only listened to Chauvelin's lengthy speech with half an ear. Her thoughts still dwelt on the past half-hour with its bitter joy and its agonising pain, and fighting through her thoughts of Percy there was the recollection of Armand which so disquieted her. But though she had only vaguely listened to what Chauvelin was saying, she caught the drift of it. Madly she longed to accept his suggestion. The very thought of seeing Percy on the morrow was solace to her aching heart. It could feed on hope to-night instead of on its own bitter pain. But even during this brief moment of hesitancy, and while her whole being cried out for this joy that her enemy was holding out to her, even then, in the gloom ahead of her, she seemed to see a vision of a pale face raised above a crowd of swaying heads, and of the eyes of the dreamer searching for her own, whilst the last sublime cry of perfect self-devotion once more echoed in her ear, Remember! The promise which she had given him, that would she fulfil. The burden which he had laid on her shoulders, she would try to bear as heroically as he was bearing his own. Ay, even at the cost of the supreme sorrow, of never resting again in the haven of his arms. But in spite of sorrow, in spite of anguish so terrible that she could not imagine death itself to have a more cruel sting, she wished, above all, to safeguard that final, attenuated thread of hope which was wound round the packet that lay hidden on her breast. She wanted, above all, not to arouse Chauvelin's suspicions by markedly refusing to visit the prisoner again, suspicions that might lead to her being searched once more, and the precious packet filched from her. Therefore she said to him earnestly now, "'I thank you, citizen, for your solicitude on my behalf. But you will understand, I think, that my visit to the prisoner has been almost more than I could bear. I cannot tell you at this moment whether to-morrow I should be in a fit state to repeat it.' "'As you please.' he said urbanely, but I pray you to remember one thing, and that is—' He paused a moment, while his restless eyes wandered rapidly over her face, trying, as it were, to get at the soul of this woman, at her innermost thoughts, which he felt were hidden from him. "'Yes, citizen,' she said quietly, "'what is it that I am to remember?' "'That it rests with you, Lady Blakeney, to put an end to the present situation.' "'How? Surely you can persuade Sir Percy's friends not to leave their chief endurance file. They themselves could put an end to his troubles to-morrow. "'By giving up the Dauphin to you, you mean?' she retorted coldly. "'Precisely. And you hoped—you still hope—that by placing before me the picture of your own fiendish cruelty against my husband, you will induce me to act the part of a traitor towards him and a coward before his followers?' 
Oh, he said deprecatingly, the cruelty now is no longer mine. Sir Percy's release is in your hands, Lady Blakeney, in that of his followers. I should only be too willing to end the present intolerable situation. You and your friends are applying the last turn of the thumbscrew, not I. She smothered the cry of horror that had risen to her lips. The man's cold-blooded sophistry was threatening to make a breach in her armour of self-control. She would no longer trust herself to speak, but made a quick movement towards the door. He shrugged his shoulders, as if the matter were now entirely out of his control. Then he opened the door for her to pass out, and as her skirts brushed against him, he bowed with studied deference, murmuring a cordial, "'Good night.' "'And remember, Lady Blakeney,' he added politely, "'that should you at any time desire to communicate with me, at my rooms, nineteen Rue du Puy, I hold myself entirely at your service.' Then, as her tall, graceful figure disappeared in the outside gloom, he passed his thin hand over his mouth, as if to wipe away the last lingering signs of triumphant irony. "'The second visit will work wonders, I think, my fine lady,' he murmured under his breath. End of chapter 30